it's a good scheme. Just for pension payments alone, that's no small change. Is government intervention necessary here? They have to offer good terms and conditions for the civil servants. Everyone and welcome back to Beyond the Headlines, your one stop for all the stories that made the headlines and more. I'm Hazwin Hassan. And I'm Amalina Kamal. And today we've got a whole list of topics to unpack, starting with the much debated civil servants retirement benefit, where we were looking at the comparison between EPF contribution as well as pensions. Now, the latest bombshell development is that the government recently said that simulations from a study showed that the EPF contribution will cost at least 4.5 times cheaper than the current pension scheme. Now, Dr. Zaliha Mustafa, Minister for Federal Territories in Parliament, said that the proposed new salary system could save money and ease the government's financial burden on the long run. We'll also be discussing the recent closure of the Goodyear plant in Shah Alam, closing its doors after 52 years since it was founded in 1972. Effective June 30th, this will impact about 550 workers. The Shah Alam factory represents the company's enduring commitment to the regional economy and automotive sector. Concerns of what the future will hold, however, for 180 Goodyear auto care locations nationwide that the company operates have been raised. And of course, in the last segment, we'll be looking into the Auditor General's report for 2022, where it was presented in Parliament on March 6th, um, and it highlighted 16 recommendations aimed at addressing issues and enhancing performance within federal agencies. Now, among these recommendations is the call for agency heads to adhere to set timelines for f- sub- submitting financial statements for auditing purposes, as well as utilising grants within the designated time frame. Now, of course, we've got some hot takes, and <coughs> what better way by inviting our expert economist here, Professor Dr. Jaffrey Williams on Beyond the Headlines. Professor, welcome to the show. Thanks for inviting me again. It's always a pleasure to come. Right. Okay, Professor, I mean, you know, let's talk about the first segment here, uh, the landscape of retirement, basically, uh, going through a shift, and it's very crucial to assess how these changes impact our civil servants. Um, I just want to understand this also because the government is expected to pay a very hefty bill come 2040, where the bill is uh, going to reach about 120 billion ringgit just for pension payments alone. And that's no small change. Yes, definitely. And with retirement charges mm. eating up over 10% of the total operating expenditure for the government, it's clear that something's got to give. Um, so on the on the EPF contributions being about four and a half times cheaper than the pension scheme already in place, um, balancing between the high income groups who would be able to obviously contribute more monthly uh, than the lower income groups, how do we first ensure that there is no undue financial burden on anyone? Is there a benchmark or a best practice that Malaysia can follow? Well, the answer is what Malaysia has is the EPF. Mm. So (coughs) if you were to compare that um, and actually, there's some, um, there's quite a lot of information in the newspapers you can take a look at, uh, which compares the EPF to other um, pension schemes, for example, in Singapore or even in Europe. And you find actually that the EPF is really not as, it's not as bad or, or very much better. It's really, it's a good scheme. But it relies upon, number one, you have to be a member. If mm-hmm. you're not a member, mm-hmm. you're not going to get the benefits from mm-hmm. it. Number two, you have to make regular monthly contributions mm-hmm. with no right. um, real breaks over the course of the whole of your working life, about 40 years. Mm-hmm. You have to have a good income so that the percentage that you're putting in, which is 11% for the employee and 13% for the employer, 24%, that has to be meaningful. So that means that your salary has to be meaningful and no withdrawals. I don't just mean the COVID withdrawals, I mean you can make withdrawals for other purposes. Right. But if you start to make w- too many withdrawals over the 40 year period, your final um, account, when the time when you retire, is unlikely to be sufficient to look after yourself in retirement. We know this. And how do we know this? Because we've had the EPF for decades, and we know that people have retired, and at the end of their working life, they don't have enough money. Yeah. So if this is going to be introduced for civil servants, it will be no different to how it Mm -hmm. is for everybody else. 
they will still have to contribute the whole of their career, no withdrawals, no breaks, and they will have to have a decent salary in order to make that contribution mm -hmm. meaningful. Mm -hmm. And it's going to cost them more money, of course, because although the, m the government saves money because they're only going to yeah. pay 13%, the civil servants have to pay the top up if they adopt the current scheme, of course. Yep. Mm -hmm. They might have a special scheme for the civil servants, but right. if under the current scheme, they will have to um, top up. And what that means is that uh, their monthly um, uh, expenditures are going to be higher. So is the government going to raise their salary in order mm -hmm. to cover that cost or not? Mm -hmm. If it does, then where is the saving for the government? Yeah. So the CPF contribution plan, or, or <coughs> plan to go ahead with this, could possibly be at the expense of um, the majority income groups, um, especially the lower ones, uh, at the expense of their disposable income. Yes, Somewhat, because yeah. <coughs> if, if they as civil servants at the moment are not making the contribution or the contribution is currently included in their salary, it's 17.5%. In the future, the EPF contribution is 24%. Mm. The government only mm. pay, the, as the employer, mm. if they keep the same scheme, the government would only pay 13% of that. The additional 11% would come from the civil right. servant. Now, this is only for new hires. Right. The existing civil servants will be unaffected by any of these changes. Right. Yep. And what that means is the big structural problem that you mentioned, 30 billion spent in 2023, going up to 46 billion yep. within six years in 2030, and then perhaps 120 billion. We, mm -hmm. we won't get to the 120 billion, but you'll still get to that um, 46 billion within the next six years because yep. that structural issue is not going to be affected by this shift to the EPF uh, for the new hires. The mm. existing mm -hmm. civil servants will um, still be on the old scheme. And that means that anybody who joined the old scheme in 2023 will still do their entire career, could be 30, 40 years, mm then they will still be on the existing pension scheme after that. So it's going to take decades for the full scheme, the structural um, problem of the full scheme to work its way out. So the basis of, the, of this you know, 4.5 times cheaper uh, to actually shadow the contributions as opposed to pensions, where, or where did it Well, lie? you have to ask the question, 4.5 times cheaper for who? For the government, right? Mm. But if, the, if it's cheaper for the government, it cannot be better for the civil servant. How can you pay uh, such, uh, so much less for the pension scheme and have the same sp pension scheme better for the civil servant? You cannot. It just doesn't make any sense for it to be a fraction of the mm -hmm. price mm -hmm. but still deliver the same benefit. That doesn't make any sense. So and if it worked, the EPF scheme worked, mm -hmm. we wouldn't have millions of EPF members with nothing in their accounts. Right. So we know the behavioral experience by looking at all of these millions yeah. of people who have EPF accounts, and behaviorally, over the course of their life, they've been taking out, or they've had breaks, they've been unemployed, they, yeah. w uh, they had families, they mm -hmm. weren't working, they moved out of contracted work into non-contracted work, they set up their, their own company, whatever it might be over all of this time. It would be different for the civil servants because they're gonna have a long-term civil service job. Mm -hmm. But if they are withdrawing during that period, then mm -hmm. they're not going to be able to build up their final account any better than anybody else. Mm. So if it's cheaper for the government, it cannot be better for the civil servants. It's the basic logic of that. It's clear, right? But the problem is, for the government, it's too expensive. You can't spend 10% or 30 billion. And that's just the retirement spending. At the same time, they're making contributions for the existing civil servants mm. who are in mm -hmm. work, their mm -hmm. contributions are mounting up as well. I think it's more like 50 billion. You take what they're paying to the retirees right. and then the contribution they're making for the people who are working, 1.3 million civil servants. So that's be clearly unsustainable for the government. We understand. There's no question about that. There's no fiscal headroom. That could all be spent on uh, health, education, social protection, but instead it's being sent, it's spent on civil service pensions. Right. And what that means is that everybody else is paying tax for that. Mm. So people who don't have a pension themselves are paying taxes to pay for the civil servant's yeah. pension. That's the real issue. Now this is not to say the civil servants don't deserve their pension. They do, absolutely. I mean, they, they, they've done their job. They've worked very hard for 40 
30, 40 years. Mm -hmm. That was what they were promised. And actually, it's not a great deal per person. I worked it out last night. It's about 2,800 mm -hmm. ringgit per person per month as a civil servant pension. And that's not particularly lavish, right? So the civil servants deserve to have it. But the, for the broader population, they're saying, you have a pension, but I have nothing. I'm paying for your pension while I don't have anything. And for the government, in terms of fiscal space, it doesn't have the fiscal space to continue to do this over the long period. It's not sustainable. Mm -hmm. right. That's um, the real root of the problem right. that the government's tackling. So the, e the move to the EPF is the first stage of the solution. <coughs> but it's not going to solve the structural problem. The government so still has to go back and solve the structural It's just problem. a slapping a, a Band-Aid on the you know, temporary kind of relief. It will reduce the long-term payments that the government will be making mm -hmm. into um, retirement schemes for new civil servants. Mm -hmm. But you know, the current 1.3 million civil servants are on the current scheme. So it's not going to affect that 1.3 million on the current right. scheme. And that's the real structural problem. Right. But what's, I think, really important to understand and to recognize is that the government, at least, the unity government, is at least acknowledging that there is a problem and starting the process. Mm, okay. And the second finance minister was the CEO of EPF, so oh, he's right. a fantastic person to have. And the head of economics and finance in the prime minister's office was the former uh, strategy, chief strategy officer, uh, Nohisham Hussain also from EPF. Mm. So if there are anybody who can deal with this problem, it's those two guys. Right. And the government has made absolutely clear, and they're pulling no punches. They're saying there is a problem here. Um, we have to go ahead and try to solve it. And they've taken the first step, mm -hmm. which is the EPF right. for the civil servants. So it's the first step. It's better now than, than, <coughs> than never. But OK, going back to your point about this sort of like transition uh, from pensions to EPF is the first step. So the second and the third step, we, we're, we're expected to see more introductions in terms of you know, um, fiscal initiatives. At least um, in your point of view, what sort of like reinvestment um, of the resources should we look into um, in terms of developing the public service area? Because all this while we've uh, come to understand that you know, the public service sector is where you want to go for retirement mm. benefits as opposed to private right now you're kind of like leveling the playing field between these two sectors mm. the private retirement schemes are available but for various reasons they're, they're not particularly popular and my view of that is that um, they're expensive and if you have an alternative for epf you would prefer to choose that so it's a very competitive market so the private retirement schemes tend to be for people who don't, for one reason or another, qualify for EPF or who are wealthy and want to use that as a top-up. Right. Mm. But it's still relatively small. And um, I don't think that there's very much scope for the private uh, retirement schemes to take a big share of the retirement market. Certainly not when EPF is the offering such a... Uh, it offers a very, very good um, product. Mm. And it's, it's getting better. Uh, all the time. So um, we do tend to look <coughs> to the public sector to, to look after these retirement uh, schemes, but EPF is actually, uh, it's your account. It doesn't belong to the government, mm -hmm. right? The money that you put mm -hmm. in belongs to you. But what we, the government can do is to look for a non-contributory pension, which would be a universal basic pension. And that right. would help to provide everybody with a decent uh, lower limit mm -hmm. um, and that would free whether you're rich or poor you get the everybody gets access to the same pension to get a non-contributory pension scheme in place you would have to have a different way of funding it because you can't fund it from general operational expenditures or taxes mm. um, because the government just doesn't have the fiscal space for that so the best way of dealing with that is to set up a, a Malaysian super fund and have it funded from the returns from the super fund. Super fund okay. would be something about the same size as EPF, but separate to mm -hmm. EPF. It's not a question of merging with EPF. It could be managed by the EPF managers, but it would be separate. And how you would set it up is you would take all of the existing government-linked investment corporations, which are actually now very small, mm -hmm. and you would merge them into a big fund. And depending on how ambitious you were, 
If you were not particularly ambitious, you could get that to about uh, 300 billion very quickly. Okay. Uh, if you were more ambitious, you can get that to about a trillion ringgit. And about a trillion ringgit is about the same size as EPF. Mm. And if you get the same rate of return, 5 to 6% a year that the EPF get, then you're getting 50 to 60 billion. Mm. Now, the benefit of that is you can pay the civil service pension and a universal basic pension from those returns. And you save 30 billion that government's spending from operational So do you think this can run alongside the EPF simultaneously, where people have the option to choose between the two? Yes, well, it would be separate to the EPF. The EPF is your personal right. account. You pay into that from mm -hmm. your salary. Mm -hmm. Don't disturb that. Let them carry on running that. But there are millions of people who don't have an EPF. So you set up a new fund separately to the EPF. But as I say, the same fund managers could look, or similar fund managers from the EPF could manage it separately. Right. Um, and then that would deliver these uh, uh, 50, 60 billion a year mm -hmm. if it were the same size and you had the same performance. And then that 50, 60 billion could then be used to pay the pensions. Mm. And, the, um, and it would release the money then right. that the government is currently spending, the 30 billion, rising to 46 billion by 2030, that would be released. The government can then spend that on yes. health, education, social protection, whatever. So the best drivers for this would still be the finance ministry? Yes, certainly, mm. the finance ministry. Not um, outsourced it to, at, at least, not into EPF per se, or well, any uh, private entities? The, the, root, the, the root of it would be the finance ministry, because the government-linked investment corporations are they mm. come under the finance ministry one way or another. But the reforms would have to come from the finance ministry. And we are actually seeing various reforms amongst the big government-linked investment corporations. Um, PNB, for example, is now merging with some smaller Bumiputra uh, mm. investment mm -hmm. companies. There's mm -hmm. a construction company and mm -hmm. a venture capital company. This is, a, in my view, a good thing because these two companies are tiny. Uh, they used to be big. <laughs> Historically, they, they were you know, considered yeah. quite large, mm. but now the world has moved on. So they will move into uh, PNB, and that increases the fund size for PNB. Some of these other um, pension funds like uh, LTAT are under scrutiny at the moment. It looks like there might be some need mm. to reform there. KWAP, which is the Civil Service Pension Fund, mm -hmm. also... Um, isn't delivering the return that's sufficient to pay for the civil service funds. Kazana National used to be can the, you know, the, 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 the showcase. Mm, it, yeah. I mean, it is a, a very, very fine organization, Kazana National, but it's small now uh, compared to where it was. Uh, it's only about 10% of the size of EPF. Mm. It's small, and when you get yeah. these it, it's billion. It's, it's yeah. 120 billion, 130 yeah. billion yeah. ringgit. So, but when you get a, a fund of that size, even if you get very good returns on it, it doesn't pay uh, for very much in the end. Right. But when you merge them together, you get more bang for your buck. And they used these uh, uh, government-linked investment corporations were fit for purpose in the past, but time has moved on. Right. Now they can be restructured and uh, reformed. Even the, the um, development finance institutions, which are basically banks, SME Bank, Agro Bank, Exim Bank, and so on, mm -hmm. these are all being reformed under budget 2024. Mm. And it's likely that they will all be consolidated. Merged. These are mm -hmm. uh, government-focused investment corporations, right. and any of the profits that they make through development financing those profits can also be used for um, a, a super fund. Right. And, and just another one, <laughs> even the dormant funds. You know, the, uh, just last week, the mm -hmm. finance minister mm -hmm. said they're going to change the, um, the regulations on dormant funds held in accounts, which okay. can be anywhere between 11, 12 billion ringgit. Mm -hmm. okay. And previously, they had to be dormant for 15 years before they were then... Um, transferred into the government. Now he's saying they're dormant for seven years. Then after 10 years, they become eligible for transfer. And there's right. another 12 billion. So when you go around and count up all of this money, you can get to that one trillion target. Mm.
Mm. I mean, we were talking about all these demog- uh, trends when it comes to finish fiscal initiatives and transitions. But I also want to talk about employer trends. Uh, what sort of employer trends do you see uh, with this sort of strategy in place, you know, having to move from pension to EPF contribution? How would um, certain uh, employers look at this as an p- opportunity to bloat their own industries uh, that's outside of the civil service? Wh- which type of employers? Uh, for instance, like uh, manufacturing, uh, which privately en- private entities, and then probably maybe tech. For instance, yeah, because mm-hmm. these are big industries, right? And then probably they will seek for loyalty, um, which the civil service uh, employees have. Oh, you s- have. oh I yeah. see. So yeah. You think yeah. that they might offer better schemes? Yes, yeah, right. Yeah. Because you have <coughs> some industries where job hopping is very common. Yes, so I yeah. understand. You see, yeah. this is one of the issues that has been raised as a big concern. In mm. fact, my, my colleague, Prof Bajoya, mentioned this as a concern which is that uh, the current civil service p- uh, pay and pension and terms and conditions of employment are actually very good mm. um, because they offer very stable long-term jobs with lots of benefits. Even if the salary might not be as high as in the private sector, the mm-hmm. benefits tend to um, make it very much worthwhile. Right. Um, and if you change that, particularly the pension, yes, then you might see other companies in the private sector offering better deals. And the, the big pull for the civil service, which is the stability and the uh, continuity of salaries and career progression, mm. won't, um, uh, won't trump the higher salary and the higher um, uh, uh, pensions and mm. other benefits that you would get in the private sector. So you might see a shift. shift. You might, mm. for How sure. How would it implicate I suppose our um, GDP growth, though, our uh, at least the st- uh, government stability of sorts, and because again, uh, the civil servants are considered the nadi of kerajaan, and then we're trying to do away with something that they hold very dear to. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, how, how, what sort of approach the government should really look into apart from fiscal initiatives? I think they have to offer good terms and conditions for the civil servants. Right. That's it, and good career progression actualization we call mm-hmm. it you know they people need to get a lot of value out of it beyond right. the salary alone mm. the salary has got to be of course imp- is, is always an important consideration right. but you want a career that's rewarding in its own sense in its own right and actually perhaps this might be a better way of doing it because we know that although there is a lot of sta- stability in the civil service the career progression is also quite rigid mm. And it's not always based on merit. It's often mm-hmm. based on how long you've been there. But you would expect yeah. to move up the grade simply because of the time that you have served. So if all of that is reformed and it becomes more agile, it will become more exciting to be a, a civil servant. Mm-hmm. And if it's more exciting to be a civil servant, it will still attract the talent. I mean, if I'm reading this correctly, I think overall across the board that this would mean we'd be more competitive. and. I personally see it if if it means maybe uh, the public sector sh- shrinking because we have a more competitive free market out there for laborers and employers. I think th- isn't that sh- supposed to be welcomed by yes. g- the government <coughs> and everyone? Uh, everyone it should else? be, shouldn't yeah. it? And but also you have to remember when we talk about civil servants, we're not mm. just talking about bureaucrats in um, the ministries in mm. Putrajaya. Mm. We're talking about teachers, we're talking about nurses in, yeah. ho- in public hospitals. So mm. uh, the Bomber and the PDRM and all of these guys, they're all civil servants, right? So what you, you have a very broad number of um, occupations within the total public sector. And you wouldn't really expect in a, in a vibrant labor market that people would take a job and stay there for the whole of their lives. Yeah. Certainly not anymore, right? You would expect that they would go in the public sector, then come out into the private sector, then go back into the public Mm. sector, then come out into the private sector. Under the current civil service scheme, if you do that, it's going to affect your, well, first your position up the grades, and also Mm. it's then it's going to affect your pension. But if you have the same uh, pension scheme as EPF in the public uh, service as in the private sector, Mm (coughs) <coughs> then your contributions go into the same account, so it doesn't matter so much. So you would have much more flexibility and much more variety. Mm-hmm. And then people wouldn't stay in the same job or the same type of job for 40 years, not learning 
uh, more in from that as they could from the private sector. Right. They will come out, go into the private sector, and then go back. Mm -hmm. So it's also another way of looking at kind of uh, revamping the whole civil service yes. uh, industry. Itself. Whether it yeah. will cause uh, a reduction in the number of civil servants is a different issue. Mm -hmm. Because we will always need the same number of teachers or a similar number of teachers. We always would want a similar number of nurses. We always would want a similar number of doctors. And these are the bulk of it. Mm. In terms of bureaucrats, that number would, the, you know, the optimal level of that number would depend upon things such as e-government and the use of mm. um, <coughs> uh, m digi digitized ways and, and automated ways of dealing with things that at the moment are dealt with by civil servants. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But certainly the, you know, the mandarins, the bureaucrats, and the people who deal with the policy, that number is probably not likely to change very much. Okay. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. Um, is there something else you wanted to add before we <coughs> end this segment, the first segment yeah. on uh, EPF versus pensions? Yeah. Maybe one last question for me um, with this whole pensions, pension versus EPF contribution, because we had um, a similar episode together with QPEX, uh, I think uh, yeah. a few episodes back, and they mentioned about um, QPEX and uh, Gukam. You know, when we're looking at restructuring the pension scheme, or at least doing away with it entirely, we should actually look at the grades. The B, the forty grade, the grade forty and below should not transition into this doing away of pe uh, of the pension scheme completely. But looking at the top down aspect, that sort of approach. <laughs> well, what do you <coughs> think? Your, your thoughts? <laughs> look, I mean, Q, uh, uh, QPACs uh, represent the members and it's their job yeah. and they do a good job of representing their members um, but the, the problem is not with the people at the top we often I mean there was a suggestion oh well, we should scrap the MPs pensions and this is going to solve the but this is not going to solve the problem Th there are too few people even though they do get much higher benefits because yeah. their salary is high, of course they do but there are too few people in that category for that to make much of a difference what you really need to do is to focus on ev everybody and change the whole system. Right. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Yeah. I think that pretty much wraps up the first segment. Um, so now we can move on to our second topic uh, for discussion on today's uh, show, where we talk about the Goodyear, uh, closure of the Goodyear plant, right? So the Ministry of Investment, Trade and Industry, or MITI for short, and the Malaysian Investment Development Authority, or MIDA, uh, are said to be taking proactive measures since news of Goodyear's plant shut down in Shah Alam, uh, since news of it came out. So, and former MITI Minister Tansri Rafida Aziz also expressed similar concerns, calling for government intervention. Uh, she says that while the government is touting around the billions of possible investments, expectations being mooted and discussed, it is so important that industrial and business entities, which are already here, do not close shop and leave for other countries. Now, mm -hmm. Professor, is government intervention necessary here or should we let the markets play it out? Uh, the markets have to play out. <laughs> it's as simple as that. I know it's, it's nostalgic. Mm -hmm. You know, in the UK, we had many, many com companies that had been around for forever, some mm -hmm. of them hundreds of years, household names. And then when they close, of course, it's very sad. The concern is really for the people who are employed directly with the company. Then the people in the supply chain and the people in the dealerships and the franchises which might be selling those products. Um, I'm pretty sure that Goodyear will have a good deal for in terms of retrenchment of the people there, 550 people. And provided that they can be given opportunities to help them to find jobs somewhere else, they, that they can be looked after. But the idea of using government money to pump up a company which the owner doesn't consider to be economically viable makes no sense at all. Mm. It's much better for us to say bye-bye, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you mm -hmm. for everything that you did. We love you very much, but it's time yeah. for us to move yeah. on to something mm -hmm. else. Right. No, because mm -hmm. I think uh, the discussion or at least uh, the argument surrounding it is because it's such a big lay layoff, right? And um, hence, that's why yeah. the government should intervene. But of course, we don't under... I mean, there are maybe certain areas where our audience or certain readers don't understand that, that it's part of a, uh, a bigger trend whereby uh, multinational corporations are um, shifting into uh, where cost-cutting measures are put into place. Um, from your observations, 
good good year is not the only uh, sort of um, business entity that is cutting costs, is streamlining their approaches. Mm. Um, do you have within the region at least uh, any other uh, industries that we should be looking at and 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 benchmarking against just to understand and navigate all, what all we're dealing with? All industries that are automating. If mm. we un if we I mean you can't have it both ways. You see, if you say we want to invest in new technologies, mm. okay, and we want the government to, under the new industrial master plan, to invest in all of these new technologies. New technologies now, fourth industrial revolution technologies now, are specifically designed to replace people. In the past, technologies used to help people to do their job better. Mm. We call them labor augmenting technologies. You still need the person, but they use a machine and then become more productive right. because of it. Uh, a fourth industrial revolution uh, technologies remove the people. They automate, they robotize in offices, they digitize. They, they're specifically designed to get rid of the people. That's the whole point of yeah. it. If you go to a, a modern day warehouse or a modern day logistics company, you will see hardly any people there anymore. Whereas in the past, you would see hundreds of people mm. driving forklift trucks and all of these sort of things, stacking shelves and all of that. All of this, you just don't see that now, right? So if you want to have the new technology, you are going to have fewer people. So with the Goodyear example, this is part, it's, this is not punishing Malaysia. This is not because Malaysian uh, employees are more expensive or more costly mm -hmm, than anybody else, mm -hmm. or they're less skilled than anybody else. None of that is the case. What's going on here is it's part of a global rationalization for uh, an industrial company providing basic products that will be needed for ev tires for ev every yeah. type of vehicle. There will be no end of demand for the, the product, but they will produce it using technologies that don't require as many people. That's it, it's as simple as that. So what we need to do is to acknowledge that if you want to invest in these fourth industrial revolution technologies, which of course you do, the consequence of that is it will replace people. So we need then to find another way of helping these people to find a source of income or a source of employment. We often call this technology resistant employment. Right. And what we mean by that is it can't be done by a machine. Mm -hmm. So what are the areas which can't be done by machine? Right. In the caring economy, for example, this is mm -hmm. a big component of the government's economic policy. As we have an aging society in particular, an aging society, more and more people are getting old. Yep. They will need more and more care uh, uh, at home or in, in um, hospitals and so on. You can't have machines do that. You have to move people into that type of activity, care right. assistance, uh, looking after elderly people, looking after children more. Uh, uh, but at the moment, these, is, these are the type of jobs which are undervalued and the, and the salaries are undervalued. So these are low paid jobs. In the future, these, this is where the, the, the growth in the demand for people will be. Mm. It won't be in technology based or manufacturing based activities because you can get machines to mm -hmm. do that. Mm -hmm. So it, is this um, in some way what you're saying would be the future of Malaysia in terms of um, the idea of it being labor intensive more towards the kind of front facing uh, yes. people to I people? Th I think sorts. so. And I think mm -hmm. not just Malaysia but everywhere in the world. But I think Malaysia ha I, uh, is ahead of everybody else in the sense that um, these types of activities are things that are very much a part of what Malaysia offers. At the moment, it's all offered as a t you know in, in the tourism and hospitality sector, we where Malaysia mm -hmm. is world yeah. class. Mm. But the type of experiences and expertise that you can learn in that sector can be applied across many other sectors, right. and that gives people opportunities to find different ways of earning a living. Mm. This is how it will be. We will go to the office less. You won't go to factories as often <laughs> as you did mm -hmm. before. But you still need to earn a living. So where would you earn a living? Right. It'll be closer to home. It'll be in more flexible working arrangements. It'll be in things that don't require technologies. So in terms of uh, job opportunities, does this mean that it's good news for people in social care and 
in that industry in hospitality than it is for maybe someone considering to take up engineering. Yes, all, all of <laughs> all of s insofar as we have these studies yes. as to where the demand for future jobs will be, it's in uh, jobs that don't require um, a bot. To take a bot, over. yes, <laughs> where, where a robot can't do it or where it can't be automated. Right. And this is creatives, teachers, carers, uh, hospitality, retail, tourism, mm. <coughs> all of these areas where you cannot get um, a machine to do it, even with ChatGPT, you cannot create, right. um, <coughs> you cannot really create the authenticity of mm -hmm. human interaction. Yeah. This is where the job growth is, and all of the studies suggest that. They might categorize different jobs or point to different partic you know, particular jobs. Right. But generally speaking, that's where it is. Right. Yeah. But mm -hmm. in <coughs> general, the region itself, we are very industry-based, right? Um, a lot of people are saying that we are losing out to nations such as um, Thailand, Indonesia, and now Vietnam. How can we move away from this sort of mindset? How can we push for a different sort of mindset? Scrap the new industrial master plan. Mm -hmm. Mo just right. move away from this nonsense. Okay. Mm. This idea, this government should... We, ha we can plan the future of our industrial strategy. You can't plan the future of the industrial strategy. It's utter rubbish. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a policy which says they want to spend 95 billion ringgit over the next seven and a half years to increase the rate of growth of value added from industrial um, activity from 6% to 6.5%, right? The total increase in the value added will be 20 billion over seven years, which is about three billion ringgit per year from an investment of 95 billion. Right. You might as well take the 95 mm. billion and put it in a fixed deposit at a commercial bank, you would get more than 3% a year. That is quite true, yeah. <laughs> and, but yeah. nonetheless, this is a legacy policy of the previous administrations. It was supposed to have been launched in 2021. But because of COVID and all the rest mm -hmm. of it, it was delayed and then it was launched under the unity government's agenda. It isn't actually a Madani policy at all. Mm -hmm. If you read it, there's, no, there's right. no Madani principles in there at all. And what you see there is a typical government should. The government knows the moonshot thinking, all of this. The government knows what uh, areas we should invest in. The government knows how much should be invested mm -hmm. in each mm -hmm. area. Mm -hmm. The government knows what should be the catalysts to do it. The government doesn't know any of those things. <laughs> it's <laughs> simply not true to right. suggest that the government knows these things. You think that Jeff Bezos went to the American government to ask him to ask them how to run what is it, Amazon <laughs> or, or, or Elon Musk went uh -huh. to the government even here in Malaysia to ask and well, how do I run my company? He didn't ask. And well, how to <laughs> run his company? He said, I want to run it there, right? M major international corporations don't ask the government how to run their, com their companies. They don't need to know that. Mm -hmm. You leave it to the market, they know how to deal with it. Even small companies don't need the government to tell them how to run their own business. So if you scrap that government should attitude, create a much more agile, much more competitive, low tax, low regulation environment, yeah. then you will start to compete against Vietnam and Indonesia because they are still high regulation, high tax mm. environments. No, we're kind of a step ahead <coughs> in, it, in, in, in a way, right? But it's just how we, we look at how we want to go into Yes, um, uh, and the problem this. for, is you see, if mm. you compare Malaysia with Vietnam or Indonesia, Vietnam is three times the size in terms of population and is growing fast. Indonesia is nine times the size of Malaysia and is growing fast. Malaysia cannot compete in terms of that size. So it has to compete in terms of agility, competitiveness, low tax, low regulation, government shouldn't attitude. <laughs> you should attitude. Right. This is what will attract um, international investors and also domestic investors because many domestic investors remember are now taking their money overseas rather than yep. keeping mm -hmm. it here yeah. mm -hmm. so you have to keep the <laughs> domestic investment here and attract the foreign investment here yeah, yeah. okay
<coughs> is there anything else you'd like? Because you've obviously answered our last question on it. Uh, what lessons can policymakers draw from these developments? Um, but other than that, is there anything else you'd like to? Um, just one thing. Up? Yeah, just one thing. Uh, in assessing the effectiveness of these government-led initiatives to kind of like, uh, repl uh, you know, repopulate people who are being laid off here, uh, how do we look at issues such as upskilling? Um, mm. or reskilling because <laughs> at the moment it's very PC it's very black and white you should do this you shouldn't do this but how can we innovatively look at um, this whole upskilling processes it also ties into this whole um, progressive wage or career development okay. uh -uh. well uh, reskilling and training people doesn't create jobs except for the trainers the guys themselves, consultants, or yes, the tr mm. I mean the training mm. uh, agencies or the the colleges or wherever they go, the consultants, whoever does the training, they make money out mm. of training schemes. Um, if I go to a training program and get a certificate, that doesn't create a job for me. I then have to go into the job market and try to sell the certificate. One of the biggest problems we have in Malaysia is underemployment. People people have qualifications but they can't find jobs that are commensurate with their qualifications. It's particularly bad for graduates. Nearly half of our graduates from Malaysian universities and colleges are in jobs which don't require a, a diploma or a degree. Okay, it's underemployment. Yeah. The, the qualifications, we talk about mismatch, mm. and often people think they're underqualified for the work that's it's completely the other way around. Yeah, they're right. overqualified. Mm -hmm. Now, <coughs> Reskilling is good, I mean, uh, I'm not against it, but you have to give the choice about the skills to the individual themselves. And rather than saying, oh, the government's going to set up uh, a reskilling in EV, electric vehicles, or the government's going to set up a reskilling in green industry issues, or whatever it is, you know, they make these decisions, you give people a training grant, let them go and choose choose for themselves what it is that they want. Mm -hmm. Then they will start to see what type of jobs uh, are available. And then they will go and they will reskill in that. Yesterday I was doing my economics class with my foundation students and I was asking them some basic questions. How much would you earn when you graduate? Mm. They will earn 1,600 ringgit. That's the starting salary of a graduate. The minimum wage is 1,500, mm -hmm. right? And I said, but if you were a TikTok content developer, you could earn that in an hour, <laughs> not in a month. You mm. could earn it in an hour, right? So if you, if you, even if you are a delivery rider or an e-hailing uh, driver, you can earn very much more than a starting level graduate. And that's why they're not coming to universities in the numbers that they were before, because mm. it doesn't make any sense at all. No mm. sense. Yeah. Mm. If you give them the money uh, to, um, to choose for themselves what it was that they wanted to learn, right. they would go out and find right. the value-added yeah. training. Because also this whole gig industry or gig economy is also not sustainable in the long run as well. So. Uh, or probably that the uh, what you just mentioned is well. I disagree. I honestly, I, I uh, honestly mm. don't agree with that. I mm. think that is the future of work. Okay. It is extremely sustainable. Right. It's the only solution that is be that is on the table now for people who would otherwise be unemployed. Right. Yeah. I mean, right. even during the uh, pandemic, it was the gig economy that was the backbone of maintaining people's jobs because we okay. couldn't go out and these guys were delivering for us. Mm -hmm. And if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be able to get so many things, right. groceries and all sorts of things that they were delivering for us. And it is actually the, the markets, the market is providing a solution to the problems of formal contracted employment. Mm. Yep. And that's in the gig economy. But we have to remember that the gig economy is not just delivery riders and e-hailers. The gig economy is freelancers, mm. lawyers, doctors, content developers, journalists, academics, mm. professionals. Mm. professionals. Mm. Mm -hmm. We are all providing jobs mm -hmm. in the gig economy. And um, that actually gives us greater flexibility, 
better work-life balance, more autonomy over our lives. We mm -hmm. choose when we do the work or not. We choose right. our clients, actually. And if we are able to do that flexibly, we can earn very much more, and we keep more of it. Mm. For every dollar that a company makes, the employee gets a third of that, and the company keeps two-thirds. Mm -hmm. That's called the compensation to employees. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the government's target is to raise that to 45%. That's one of the yeah. key Madani targets. Mm -hmm. But if you work in the gig economy, you keep almost all of it yourself. Not <laughs> well, true. I mean, yeah, you would have more control over yes. how much you earn, but I think... It's a different it mindset, you see. It, it's is, it, it is, is yeah. more precarious. You have to go out and find the clients for yourself. You mm -hmm. have to set up your um, you have to work way really hard. Yes, how do they yeah. connect to you? But there are many sharing Towards economy, we call it. <laughs> yeah. You know, we have these but sharing economy sites. Mm. And the sharing economy sites is to say, look, I'm a content developer, you can hire me. Mm -hmm. I'm an accountant, you can hire me. I'm a, a lawyer, we're well, not quite lawyer, but you, uh, you know, you, yeah. this whole right. idea, I'm right. a tutor, you can hire me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The uh, network expansion <coughs> here is bigger. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so and, and I guess in, in some respects, obviously, you can't choose both. You can have either financial freedom or choose you know, the safe security yes. of the financial freedom. Half of the people working mm -hmm. in formal private, private sector jobs earn less than 2600 a month. Mm -hmm. less than the poverty level right. indicated salary. And that's what mm -hmm. the private sector f uh, formal contracts are offering. Mm -hmm. and that's why people are leaving. <laughs> yep, that is true. Well, uh, we are going to still continue on with this uh, episode. Uh, but before we get to our final uh, topic of discussion, we're going to take a quick break and uh, we'll be right back after this. So stay tuned. Right, so we're back and we're going to finish off with our third topic of discussion uh, for today um, on the latest Auditor General's report, uh, which has uh, recently uh, been out and published, and it got some eye-opening recommendations for federal agencies. Datuk Wan Suraya Wan Muhammad Razi, the AG, highlighted 16 key recommendations aimed at improving financial management and accountability. Right, and some of the stand-up points here uh, are include that the agency heads need to step up their game when it comes to submitting financial statements for auditing. Now, this is very administrative, but of course, timeliness is key. And also, let's not forget about ensuring that grants are used for their intended purposes. Um, what does that mean? We definitely will be looking into this. Um, but the bigger question here is that, you know, um, between transparency and responsibility, will these recommendations be taken seriously into consideration. Thoughts, Professor? <laughs> well, are they going to take the recommendations <laughs> seriously <laughs> into consideration? Well, how many Auditor General reports have we had? Um, <laughs> I've been here for 20 for years. For as long as you've I been here in this I've country? Seen every, every year, similar right. comments. Mm -hmm. All I can say is that the Auditor General Office does a great job in highlighting these issues. But in the end, it's not the uh, AG's office that can actually deal with the enforcement. You need to have that at the ministry level or I at the agency level. And that's really where the problem arises because you have a principal agent problem, as we call it in economics, mm. which is these organizations are accountable ultimately to the government, who is accountable to parliament, who is accountable to the people. Yep. But the managers are here today and gone tomorrow. And mostly we don't yeah. know who they are. And the Auditor General does not name the individual managers who are responsible. I mean, you mentioned not putting in the financial statements for the Auditor General to audit. In time. <laughs> <No. Yeah. laughs> I mean, this is just absolutely basic, mm. right? Yeah. And the problem is we don't know who that person was. And w in terms of the board, this is something that I noticed about these issues or some of the bigger uh, uh, organizations that were highlighted by the Auditor General. If you look at the board, the nobody, I don't know anybody who is on these boards. And if you look at them, they tend to be civil servants. S and they tend to be anonymous. They're civil servants. They're not commercial. They're here today, gone tomorrow. They're not um, accountable. 
they're credible. Mm. They're very well qualified senior people for mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But they don't have the level of accountability and you certainly don't have the level of transparency. Now, there are many people who say you shouldn't have politicians on the boards of statutory agencies and GLCs and all the rest of it. My view is completely the opposite. Mm. When there's a politician on the board, that's often the only person that you recognize. And that politician is accountable on a daily basis <laughs> because people know that the politician is on the board mm -hmm. of the company that and they know what's going on inside the company needs right. to be sorted out. So who will they ask? They ask the politician. But under the current circumstances, if they ask a civil servant who's on the board, the civil servant say, I'm sorry, I can't discuss it. it <laughs> I'm a civil servant. Right. 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 So they don't necessarily have that level of accountability. They also don't necessarily have the commercial background. They have a bureaucratic background mm, rather right. than mm. a commercial background. Many of the problems that you just listed and highlighted by the uh, Auditor General, you would never see that in a commercial company of that size. And uh, the reason you wouldn't see it in a commercial entity of that size is that somebody will be held accountable for it mm -hmm. straight away quickly and ultimately every year if the auditor gives a report like that of a private entity the board will or somebody on the board will be held accountable liable mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. legally liable do you think that having a politician <coughs> in charge is different than having a political appointee well i'm of the view that the whoever is in charge we should know who they are if it's a public body. Mm -hmm. If it's a private company, I don't care. It's a, what goes on there is a matter for them. It doesn't matter if I don't know the members of the board of a private construction company or a private bank or something like that. S or fa particularly, it's a family business. It's their business, mm -hmm. right? But these are public entities. And it's right that there should be politicians there yeah. so that we know who they are and we can hold them to account, mm -hmm. right? Because, I mean, they can be asked in parliament in principle. And if they're on the yep. board and they're sitting in parliament, the speaker could ask them mm. to stand up and say, the Auditor General mentioned this, mentioned your name or your, your organization. What do you have yeah. to say? It's or somebody could ask them yeah. directly in parliament, what do you have to say about this? Right. And then they would have to answer to that. And they wouldn't be happy about answering for things like, where are the, <laughs> where are the accounts? The money, yeah. <laughs> 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 I mean, good Lord. <laughs> yeah. uh, I mean, uh, apart from that is that uh, mm. we also have to talk about the dormant subsidiary companies within federal agencies yes. here. Um, th this is also being stated in the Auditor General's report. So how do you think, um, you know, uh, what are the potential risks uh, associated with these entities if we don't okay, address it? Okay, I love it? this. Yeah. <laughs> I love this, yeah. this topic. Mm. Because these dormant companies uh, may be dormant now, but potentially they, they come alive. So the, the, the holding company or the big, com the big company has a contract. Mm. Normally, they should tender this contract out to some private sector, normally an SME, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. But they don't do that. Mm. Instead of contracting it out to, s to many SMEs, mm -hmm. private sector SMEs, they wake up the dormant company. And then the, yeah. the contract from the big entity goes into the dormant company, which is then, and they justify that by saying, well, we own it, and there's all sorts of management uh, um, benefits from us to do that. Mm. They wake up the dormant company. They, they crowd out the private um, SMEs in particular. Right. And there were tens of thousands of these companies. When Terence Gomez did his book, uh, it was called uh, Ministry of Finance, Inc. And he did a very, very forensic analysis of the number of GLCs and the number of GLC subsidiaries. Many mm. of them are dormant. Mm. And this, he found 68,000 mm. amongst only the top 30 GLCs. And of course, those are the big GLCs, right. and now we know there's a GLC is in Kedah, for example, that isn't paying its staff. It's a very, very tiny company, mm -hmm. but that's one of the type of things. Now, Terence's solution is close them down. Mm -hmm. I understand that. But my, my view of this is that that's an asset. It's a public asset. So how do you solve it? Privatize it. Mm. Okay. You privatize it, it won't be asleep anymore. <laughs> you give it to somebody, it will have to stand on its own two feet. You require it 
to bid and tender with any other private mm. sector company, mm -hmm. then the market and will provide a solution. And not just merely an extension of uh, yes. the so government. Yeah. Right. So this will actually manage the or prevent losses yes. um, that we have been experiencing. Government want to in, in improve the Bumiputra equity ownership. Mm. Privatise it to Bumiputra. Mm. They want to increase mm. women involvement in the economy in various forms. Yeah. Privatise it to women groups. We call this responsible privatization. I wrote a paper on it for ideas. Mm. The idea is that you don't just sell it to the you know, whoever's going to give you the most money. Mm. You want these dormant companies to, they're in a particular location. You want them to create jobs for people in that particular location. You sell it only to people who are in that location. If you want to uh, encourage, as I, you know, as I mentioned, women's groups, uh, minority groups, majority groups like the Brimby Putra, youth, uh, people with disabilities, whatever it is, you privatize it specifically because it would have a social and environmental aim in terms of the privatization, right. as well as bringing it, uh, waking, waking it up, bringing the company mm. back to life and generating value from the company. When you say privatizing it, I, are you also um, mm. uh, uh, factoring in the NGOs we're speaking about? You can mm. privatize it to NGOs. Mm. You can turn these dormant um, subsidiaries into social enterprises and give it to NGOs, for example. Mm. Because, I mean, existing <coughs> agencies and NGOs have been working together, right? It's just yes. these uh, exist Plenty separately. of opportunities for doing that. I, I just mentioned um, underemployment, mm. underemployed graduates. You could privatize it to underemployed graduates. Mm. Right? You just have to make it available to them. You have to give them the opportunities to uh, have that space. But you see, at the moment, they're crowded out because all of these uh, subsidiaries, some are dormant, some are sort of semi-dormant, some mm -hmm. are big, some are small, mm -hmm. but all of them are first in line when it comes to getting the contract from the main JLC. And that's because they are a subsidiary of the main GLC. So right. they have that preference. Mm -mm. Take away that preference by privatizing it, you open up the opportunities for people who at the moment are being excluded from those opportunities. And need, need the And they need the yeah. jobs, they need the opportunities, yeah. yes. Mm. Makes a whole lot of <laughs> sense, really. <laughs> yeah. It was a great mm. paper. It was 2019, it's called Responsible Privatization. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and just, we were talking also about pensions. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you privatize 68,000 um, companies and you got a million ringgit for each one of them, you had 68 billion ringgit. And you can use that mm. to pay for the pensions. That mm. is true. Um, <laughs> you only yeah, need to yeah, sell that it for is, a, yeah, a million Yeah, makes a lot of ringgit. sense, really. Yeah. <laughs> now, for federal agencies facing growing concerns, uh, as we heard from the recent uh, reports following the um, AG, uh, AG's comments yeah, uh, on her latest report, Agencies such as Felder and Prima, uh, the housing initiative, right? They reported a big loss as well. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of it has come down to they found to mismanagement, misuse and those sort of things, even to, you know, to an extent, corruption, right? So what specific challenges do they face in terms of debt levels and reliance on government assistance? In that? Yeah. Okay, so I think that the two examples you mentioned, Prima and Felder, mm -hmm. they're they're rather different, but there is something in common. The difference is, if you look at the Prima issue, the, the losses are not that large in, in the big scheme of okay. things. They're measured in hundreds of millions rather than billions. Mm. That is a large uh, amount, but it's, it's potentially solvable simply by changing the price of the properties that they're selling. They, they basically, they build the properties and they're having difficulty selling mm -hmm. the properties. Well, the market says you you reduce the price and then you get it off off your um, stock. So it could, in principle, be solved through that um, process. If it was a private company, by the way, it would already have done that. Mm. It would mm. not carry this level of loss if it was private. And that means that because it's a, a government-linked entity, it's being protected. So win, lose, or draw, the management don't care, right? Mm -hmm. Broadly speaking, because they're not going to be held to account. So that's one of the main reasons why you should privatize these companies, because they, they can't do that in the private sector. They have to win, <laughs> at least, yeah. or at least balance the books. <coughs> yeah. 
if you compare that to Felder, f the, the, the issue with Felder is rather different, and that's because it's so huge. It's such a massive organization with multiple entities. Lots and lots and lots of these subsidiaries are in, the f in, in Felder, yeah. Yeah. right? And the problem there is it's become far too big to manage, mm. but it's also too big to fail. That, that. And that's mm. true also of yeah. Prima. In both instances, mm -hmm. this is the, the two things that connect them is uh, there's no accountability and you know, win, lose or draw, the board of directors is not held to account. That's the first thing. But the second thing is the debt because both are carrying very large amounts of debt. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and although formally this might not be considered part of the national debt, if it's a contingent liability in the end, the government will have to pay for that. Right. So it's the debt issue mm -hmm. that needs to be handled. So certainly uh, in Prima, that can be solved through restructuring of the company. Mm -hmm. In the Felder case, it would, in my view, only be solved by breaking it up. And privatization in this sense, I think, um, will help that, right? So because they become smaller yes. through restructuring, um, they're no longer too big to fail. And yes. Therefore, you don't need the government to bail them out. Yes, right? and they're accountable to their shareholders. Mm. And the board of directors would be accountable, not just to the shareholders, but they would be much more accountable in law. Mm. Right. At the moment, if the civil ser <coughs> if the board of directors is composed of civil servants, the civil servants have a degree of immunity because they're, because they're civil servants. Mm. Right? But if you are a private director of a private company, you're accountable under the Companies Act and various mm, other mm -hmm. uh, legislation that would uh, hold you to account. But in print, the, the principal thing is you're accountable to your shareholder, right. your shareholders. Mm. Yeah. Because uh, I'm just like looking at um, this <coughs> whole, uh, you know, <laughs> federal agencies reporting. Because for Felda per se, yes, um, stakes are higher for them because uh, they have a lot of subsidiaries in them. But of also they reported like a billion. Mm. In loss, in net, yeah, net loss, loss yeah. net loss. Yes. That's double the amount the year the year before. So, um, you know, this whole idea of making Felda independent might not necessarily be uh, such a uh, I forget the impossible thing mm. to look no, into. No, could mm. you imagine a private company carrying a, a one yeah. billion? Ring it unfathomable. Mm. Uh, really, yeah. Yes, and then surviving, and no one is held accountable uh, exactly. for that. Exactly. So. Mm. Of course not. I mean, if it happened for various reasons outside of their control, they would be required to fix that pretty quickly, yeah. right? And yeah. someone would lose their job, <laughs> right? Exactly. But in this yeah. case, it's sort of like, well, we lost a lot of money. Can you give me some <laughs> money to help <laughs> it out? Yeah. Oh, and by the way, can I also have a pay increase? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, because uh, <coughs> you know, all these federal agencies again um, among the sixteen recommendations is like to utilize the grants within the designated time frame. And Felda has received a lot of grants. <laughs> From your your observation, do you know where or the? <laughs> I mean, we don't want to say anything, but it's more of like where sh where did Felda fail? <laughs> I think it's it's the. It's the fact that it's so large and that nobody mm. can keep their eyes on everything. Mm. That's, the, that's the nature of the failure. I'm pretty sure that even within the management team, they are not completely familiar with everything that's going on across such a massive entity. And then when it gets up to the board level, which is the governance level, the board only know what they're being told by the managers and by the auditors and by the... Um, I guess the corporate, the company secretary and the company lawyers. And so nobody actually has their hands on in terms of hands on management. So it's more of an operational issue as opposed to governance issue here. Well, there is a governance issue in terms of the accountability, who, who in the end is going to be mm. um, held to account. Mm. Well, the answer is nobody, <laughs> right? But then it's also a management issue because the people in the governance level are supposed to be watching the managers. Yeah, they let, let it happen. Yes, yeah. but we have what we call a principal agent problem, mm. which is they let the managers go ahead and run the company, and managers are human beings like everybody else. Even if they're civil servants, they're human beings like everybody else. And so they are going to run it according to their own personal incentives. It's mm. basic, we call it public choice theory in economics. Basic public choice theory. Mm -hmm. And it says... I have a job, I'm going to run it 
in a way that is easiest for right. me. Yeah. Whether that makes you money or not, I don't care, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> because I'm going to get paid. Whether provided I don't get into trouble, I'm going to get paid. If I'm successful, I probably won't get very much more. If I f uh, fail, I probably will get away with it. So I'm going to behave somewhere in the middle. Then you get no innovation, no creativity, no real attention. Mm. And if things are going wrong, they will quickly move. Mm -hmm. And they won't be there anymore. And that's just mm -hmm. normal. It's not a criticism of anybody or pointing a finger of any particular person or any type of person. It's just human nature. Right. And if you're in a huge organization, nobody knows your name. That's yeah. the truth of it. Right? Okay. Yeah, I think that perfectly sums up the discussion. <laughs> <laughs> Making sure that everyone is held accountable. Accountability, I mean, across yeah. the board, that just uh, you know applies to everything. Mm. Well, um, before we end, uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Always, Jeff, yeah. uh, for coming on to the show for your third time. Right? I think so. Yes. Yeah. It's Always great to have you back, and <laughs> we always look forward to having you back on many more times. Okay, next time we'll talk about something else. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> something, something other than <laughs> economy. <laughs> something other than your economy. Right, right. so um, to those of you watching us, um, thank you so much for uh, staying tuned. Um, if you like this episode, please hit that like button, and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, the channel you're watching this uh, uh, now, uh, NSC Online. And also, don't forget to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, or X. Um, and if you would like to keep up with all the latest updates and news from this show, Beyond the Headlines, and all the other stuff uh, on, uh, from NSD Online, make sure you put on and turn on the notification bell so you don't miss out. Um, and with this uh, opportunity, I'd also like to wish all our Muslim viewers, everyone who observes Ramadan, a happy Ramadan, Ramadan Mubarak. We hope that um, your fasting days go splendid. Uh, fasting, uh, how many days has it been now? I've lost count, actually. I really it's been a week. So I've week. lost count, yes. too. But better, yeah. yeah. So we <laughs> hope that the uh, fasting days have gone smoothly for you, and we hope that this month continues to bring blessings to you and your loved ones mm. and uh, on behalf of the entire crew here on set i'd like to thank you all for watching and staying tuned i'm hazreen hassan till next time goodbye <laughs>